Welcome to this episode of Orthodontics in Summary. Today's episode is entitled The Art of Disarticulation in Orthodontic Therapy. And this was a lecture by Delia Albocal. Just a quick reminder, the podcast is the opinion piece of myself and may not be 100% representative to the lecture. It is the independent work of myself and the Orthodontic in Summary team. So getting back to Dahlia's lecture, she started off looking at the clinical indications for the use of Biprops, with actually an emphasis on two innovative ways to resolve a malocclusion through their use. She then focused on looking at some tips and complications of the use of Biprops. So the definition to start with, well it's, it's disocclusion by the use of bite turbos, so the teeth can have potential freedom in three planes of space. So what's the indications for the use of bite turbos or bite props? Well, the most commonly used aspect of it is for vertical changes. The use of deep bite cases for bite turbos, anterior bite block enabling posterior eruption. The counter to that, well, the anterior open bite case where posterior bite blocks can be used to enable posterior intrusion. And Dahlia spoke of Hernandez's paper from 2017 that showed with one millimeter posterior intrusion, we managed to get four millimeters of overbite increase. When it comes to transverse correction, well, we have a functional displacement, a shift. Posterior bite blocks can be used to allow disarticulation to take place, stopping posterior interferences whilst we use an expander to correct the transverse relationship. She spoke about the pseudo class three, so the anterior displacement, use of a Caitlin appliance or using resin bite blocks as Neil Kravitz spoke about in 2019 in the JCO paper, which allows us to correct this through an inclined anterior bite plane, creates a clockwise rotation of the mandible and therefore correction of our class three case. She also spoke about other uses of a bite block. And this was news to me, the use of an anchorage reinforcement through using bite blocks in a posterior segment. And this was Giorgio uh, Ferrello's paper from 2013. And essentially it's creating deep intercuspation between the upper and lower teeth, preventing the mesial movement of the block or inter-arch uh, anchorage which is created. Dali then spoke about a new method of using bite props for correction of a malocclusion. This was her paper in the AJODO in 2020, and she coined the term D-Bibra. So D-Bibra stands for bonded inclined bite raises and elastics. So what is this? Well, essentially it's a correction of a class two malocclusion. It's a use of flowable composite. She spoke about using triad gel, placed on both the upper and lower first premolars. So how does it work? Well, the idea is of using a 45 degree inclined bite plane formed by either resin modified GIC or flowable composite in the form of triad. And this creates an anterior displacement similar to a conventional twin block appliance or functional appliance. The activation is of two millimeters. Now it can be made indirectly through models and a transfer tray, but the key thing is it can be reactivated chair side with the use of more triad gel or resin modified GIC. In Dahlia's paper in the AJODO, she spoke about removal in her cases around the seven month mark. Now there are some challenges with this approach and that is pertinent to when the patient is asleep. They won't be in occlusion, therefore they won't be posturing forwards. This is where Dahlia brings in the elastics with class two elastics to guide the patient into occlusion and therefore to the forwards displaced position. Now the second method of correcting a malocclusion using bite props is of occlusal cant or asymmetries. And this is actually Giorgio uh, Farello's paper from 2013, a second paper of his. Now in this he spoke about mandibular repositioning with the use of triagel again, seems to be a common theme. But this time it was through full coverage to the occlusion based upon the lower arch and the buccal cusps to create guidance. Now he looked at 32 papers, 32 patients he had treated using this and showed that at a two year follow-up, two thirds of them had stable correction to the malocclusion and also stable TMJs. The second half of Dahlia's lecture was looking at bite turbos and giving some tips. She spoke about for anterior bite turbos, either resin uh, resin uh, bonded bite turbos can be used or metal turbos, but there is a high incidence of failure and to be aware of that. An acrylic bite plane can be used in the form of a modified nuts. 
and also digital design can be used to achieve an even occlusion. She spoke about the use of bi-turbos that can be extended in the case of large overjets, which may be more likely to undergo fracturing. I know I've experienced that myself in clinical practice. She spoke about a solution to this, and that is to apply the bite turbo not to the anterior teeth, but actually to move towards the canines, where the overjet or buccal overjet will be reduced. She both spoke about her clinical tips, and that is the use of articulated paper to make sure there's even contact on it, and to adjust the bite turbo if it isn't the case. She spoke about how bite turbos need to be planned based upon the center of rotation of the teeth it's making contact with. And she broke this down really nicely with some really easy to follow images, and I've replicated them here. So the premise here is that we've got the average inclination of pair and lower incisors. When they're making contact on that bite prop, the vertical forces are relatively close to the center of resistance. Therefore, the intrusive effect will be relatively in one plane. However, if we look at the bimaxillary proclination case, now actually the vertical vector is anterior to the center of rotation of these teeth. So what effects does that have? Well, essentially in the upper arch, it's going to create a counterclockwise rotation to the incisors, in the lower arch, a clockwise rotation. Essentially, it's gonna worsen the bimaxillary proclination by proclining both upper and lower incisors further. And the opposite is true for upright incisors, creating a retroclination effect. Dahlia spoke about the complications of using bite turbos. They are, can be uncomfortable, especially in speech. She explained that it's important to reassure patients, try to use the minimal thickness of bite turbo that is possible, and to advise patients to use a soft diet for the first few days. She mentioned to keep an eye out for traumatic occlusion to the PDL, monitor mobility of the dentition, look for wear and breakages taking place. I know this is something I've definitely seen in my cases and also to warn patients of the loss of vitality. And in my experience, this is really for the patients who have had previous trauma to their incisors, and this could then be enhanced by the occlusal forces from the bite turbo. She spoke about undesired effects of the intrusive effects. We can get intrusion taking place on the anterior teeth. And actually there was a paper at the beginning of 2021 which looked at this by Alzubi, which showed approximately half a millimeter of intrusion over three months of the use of a bite turbo. She also spoke about bruxism and functional shifts and also occlusal canting that can take place. In summary, Dahlia spoke about the use of bite turbos allowing the correction of a malocclusion in three planes of space potentially but also having the risks of creating a malocclusion or undesired tooth movement in three planes of space. So for us to factor that in to planning our use of them around the vertical vector. Now Dahlia's lecture is available on YouTube if you want to watch it in full following the link. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Orthodontics in Summary. Please do subscribe and look forward to the next episode.